On our channel, you'll find an hour-long documentary and a half-hour-long animation about the sinking of the SS Atlantic in Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1873. In a lot of the comments, there's been discussions on who is to blame. And this is a question that's been around since the day the ship went down. Before I go any further, I really want to encourage you to watch both of those videos before watching this one. There's a lot of background information that I'm not going to be explaining. I'm going to take for granted that you did watch both of them. The ship went down on April 1st in the very early hours of the morning. As there was no telegraph in the town that she wrecked at, runners were sent to Halifax, the nearest city, to let people know of the disaster. A few runners were sent out, but 3rd Officer Brady, who survived the sinking, volunteered to do the walk of almost 21 miles himself just after getting off the ship. When he arrived in Halifax, a lot of people actually thought it was an April Fool's joke. If you ask the surviving crew of the Atlantic, Officer Brady is the true hero of the disaster. He saved a lot of people during the sinking, and then he volunteered to summon help, go a long distance, and summon help right after that. He and Chief Officer Firth are unquestionably heroes of the disaster. But the world doesn't like focusing on heroes. They like villains. Let's talk about who is potentially to blame for the disaster. An inquiry committee was formed almost immediately after, and they interviewed almost two dozen people, including surviving crew and passengers from the sinking, captains of similar ships, and even lighthouse keepers from the area. The inquiry wanted to know what the cause of the disaster was and who was responsible. They came to five conclusions. Number one, the position of the ship was off, given the current unnoticeably pushing the ship 12 miles to the west. Number two, the ship's speed was actually 12 knots, while the captain believed it was only 11, which brings them closer to the shore faster than he expected. Number three, Sambro Island Light, which the crew were looking for, was determined to be visible, even though it was sleeting only an hour before the disaster, and the crew should have been able to spot the light, even though they didn't. Number four, no depth sounding was done to determine how deep the waters were. And finally, number five, Captain Williams should not have gone to sleep when he did. As a result of the inquiry, only two actions were done against the Atlantic's crew members. Captain Williams had his master's certificate suspended for two years. His sentence was mitigated to this as the court gave him a very special consideration. Though they believed him to be at fault for the disaster, they also commended him for his actions during the sinking. Fourth Officer Brown had his master's certificate suspended for three months. He was second in command of the watch, under second officer Metcalf, and the inquiry blamed him for not spotting the light, as well as Metcalf's decision to stop the steward from waking the captain. Second officer Henry Metcalf, who was on watch at the time of the disaster and may have been the most responsible, was the only officer to not survive the sinking. Possibly as a result of this, the courts did not consider him for any of the blame. He was barely mentioned during the inquiries. A second inquiry was held a month later by the British Board of Trade to evaluate the guilt of the White Star Line, which eventually found that the ship was properly supplied and cold, and that the White Star Line was not to blame. They also believed that when given the wrong information by Engineer Foxley, Captain Williams made a prudent decision when he diverted to Halifax. But let's open up a discussion right here. I fully expect a lot of people to comment below and share their opinions and discuss amongst each other about who they think was at fault. When Captain Williams gave his testimony, he gave an emotional and powerful statement. Quoting the New York Tribune, he broke down on reading it and with difficulty resumed. He may be guilty, but no man with the memory of that fearful night throbbing in his soul could remain impenitent. One of the first questions with the captain is, was he drinking? He had been supposedly fired from the Guion line for drinking on duty, but this is uncertain. Passenger Daniel Kinane says he never saw the captain drink on duty, and J. Spencer Jones saw him offer to drink at 11 p.m. the night of the disaster, which he refused. He was not drunk, and his competence as a captain was praised, even by Chief Officer Firth, who said he never served under a better captain. But nonetheless, he did make mistakes. Was the ship going too fast for the conditions? He wasn't even aware of the ship's exact speed at the time, and certainly the waters around Halifax are known to be dangerous. Was it reckless to speed? 
And as your ship is speeding through unfamiliar, dangerous waters at night, at the end of a winter storm, is it wise to go to sleep? Chief Engineer John Foxley was responsible for the management of the ship's engines, boilers, and coal reserves. On a daily basis, Captain Williams asked him to estimate the amount of coal they had left, which Foxley always underestimated. The reasoning behind underestimating the coal reserves is sound. There's no questioning that. It's always best to underestimate something that you're relying on, be it food, or coal, or even just the money in your pocket. It encourages you or the user to be more conservative about the usage of it and cautious about the consumption. But towards the end, when accuracy was most needed, Foxley underestimated once more, knowing full well that this would divert the ship. But Foxley did this to defend his pride. In fact, it wasn't even so much his pride as it was that captains and company officials really discourage engineers from underestimating like this. They don't feel it's in the chief engineer's authority to misguide his superiors based on his own instincts. He should present the facts exactly as they are, with which suggestions are always accepted and welcomed, but not take matters into his own hands and mislead those relying on him. Foxley did testify that he knew that the ship had more than enough coal to reach New York, and a diversion was unnecessary. He claims to have told the captain this, but Williams and other eyewitnesses disagree. Before diverting to Halifax, Captain Williams met with Chief Officer Firth and Chief Engineer Foxley to discuss the rerouting, the dangers, and the delays that it would cause. Even having these considerations expressly explained to him, he still agreed to divert based on his own misinformation. During the sinking, however, Foxley also acted heroically, keeping his crew in the boiler rooms, which had already lost all lighting and were rapidly flooding, just long enough to extinguish all boilers and cut the engine. If not for this, the ship would have broken itself apart more rapidly, perhaps even blowing itself in half and killing many more. Finally, Second Officer Metcalf. He had actually already been condemned for a previous disaster. While on watch, his ship ran down and sank another ship. Very little details remains on this event, unfortunately, so I can't go into too much explanation about it. But that happened. Just saying. Captain Williams told Officer Metcalf to wake him at 3 a.m. or when they spot the lighthouse, at which point they would stop the ship and anchor until morning, when they'd navigate into the harbor by daylight. At 3.15, the ship struck the rock. Had Metcalf woken up Captain Williams, the ship would probably have stopped around 3.05 or 3.10 and safely anchored that night. By morning, yes, they would have woken up to the sight of land only a mile ahead of them, and yes, they would have certainly been shaken, and they'd realize what would have happened if they hadn't stopped. Captain Williams was cutting it close. Nonetheless, Officer Metcalf did not wake up the captain. In fact, not only did he fail to wake him up, but he seems to have deliberately shown intent to disobey the orders to wake him up. A steward was sent up to wake the captain at 2.45, and Officer Metcalf stopped him. A little after 3, the quartermaster at the helm warned Metcalf that they were getting dangerously close to land. Of course, no land was visible, but this quartermaster knew Halifax and was speaking on instinct. Metcalf disregarded him. Five minutes after the collision, Metcalf had a heated fight with the captain. Metcalf insisted on launching the lifeboats, while Captain Williams insisted that the lifeboats were too dangerous. Metcalf stood in one of the lifeboats, leaning against the falls, shouting at the captain on deck, who was pulling the women and children away from the lifeboat. They shouted back and forth in anger, but they were interrupted by the collapsing of the boat, crashing down into the sea, killing all on board, including Officer Metcalf. What are your thoughts? Can blame be placed on any one individual? Or a combination of them, or a little bit of all of them? Or were the elements simply against them and you can't pinpoint it on one specific person? Is there anything I left out? Anyone or anything? Leave a comment below with your thoughts and feel free to discuss with each other. And don't forget to please support the SS Atlantic Heritage Society at www.ssatlantic.com.